They always tell me. Okay. What are we talking about today? Well, uh, as you know, this is our eighth lecture, right? And we have really in the eight lectures only had one true wartime lecture. Today is number two. And today we continue on a long train and we'll begin the train of talking about the war proper, the war in focus, so to speak, because we had our background, we had the last uh, lecture that was kind of off topic, just talking about the chemical weapons and the trench life. This one, I actually thought it was Luke Russell with your avatar, Dave. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed it's you. Uh, so far, what I want you to compare mentally or to your notes that you took today's lecture with what happened on the Western Front, okay? Right? The, the, the title of the lecture today is Tannenberg and Eastern Front through 1914. So after today, there are more theaters than simply the West and the East. There's the Southern Theater. We're going to talk about the 12 battles, battles of Isonzo and the Italians, the Italians versus the Austro-Hungarians. It is a true global conflict. There's activity in the Middle East. There's activity in Africa. Of course, the United States gets involved later. But for all intents and purposes, after today's class, we'll have 1914 pretty well stitched up. What do we have in the West? Remember, in the West, the highlights from two classes ago, from a week ago, was the Germans invade through neutral Belgium, Schlieffen plan. This connects the Schlieffen plan. What was the point of the Schlieffen plan? Attack France in six weeks before what happens? Sophie, what happened? Russia, Russia is so expletive deleted backwards, so just drunk 24 seven, can't get their act together. They will not be able to mobilize in the six weeks before we crush the absolutely um, weak and ineffectual French as we did in 1871, the Franco-Prussian War, and all will be good. We Germans will avo avoid fighting a two front war because we'll crush the French. The Russians won't get their act together. We'll just direct all our forces east, no problem. We know Recapping last class, this starts off as a stunning success. The Belgians put up a strong fight. They defeat that chocolate soldier stereotype. But what primarily absolutely annihilates the Belgians? The Belgians. Well, what is the problem? The Germans march through Belgium, conquer hundreds and hundreds of miles of land. What is the main reason why? One answer, right? Uh, technical uh, acumen. Well, you have like a response to the technical. Yeah. Right. right, especially defensively, right? And this is actually weird. Remember, I talk about often in this class and I say, number one can be defined as feudal attrition by being a defensive war. And we're going to talk a lot about that in 19, beginning in 1915. And 16 is the worst year with the Somme and Verdun. The fact that, as de Gaulle famously said, it doesn't matter how much courage you have against a machine gun, right? If you have the high ground, whether with artillery pieces or machine gun, um, nests, uh, your, your enemy can do nothing. Of course, he's going to stay around the whole time. The opening of the Western Front is a foil to that or an argument against it because the Germans go on the offensive. And despite the fact these forts in Liège and Namur and Dinan are actually very well uh, equipped, very well um, built for the times when they were constructed in the 1890s, as Bessie said perfectly, they have no technological response for big Bertha guns that can shoot from 80 miles away, hit the fort, bury inside the fort, and then blow up from the inside, right? Completely just destroy everything. But as we know, where does the German progress halt in the West? <laughs> At the Battle of the Marne, September 5th to 12th, right? And people have said this may be the, arguably the greatest uh, victory of the century. We, of course, we propagandists, we who are pro-French, pro-British, we join the Allies, of course, say this. So all right now for what we have tonight. Oh, good. For, for the Eastern Front or for the Marne? For the Marne. Oh, good. I okay. Back up oh, good. Cool. Awesome. Uh, um, Anna, Anna Kresslins and I are working constantly on trying to get these things on, on Vandal Catholic in like YouTube channel which has, I have Justin Bieber is following it now. So it has some followers. Um, the Battle of the Marne, right, is Germans have made their way across, keep your mental map, all of you, right? They've made it all across Belgium, Luxembourg. They'll hold that land until 1918. The Germans win the First World War, period. So the Americans come in and stay right on time, right? Stunning success, which Winston Churchill will admit. But with the Battle of the Marne, it's not so much a, a, a French and Allied victory to combine French and British expeditionary force victory. It just stymies the German, the Germans and avoids the knockout blow. Remember, the Germans had captured Antwerp and Brussels. If they capture Paris, it is 1870-71 repeated. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the Franco-Prussian War when the German Empire 
um, is born out of that was a stunning two week victory, basically like the Blitzkrieg in World War II. Um, and uh, if, if that takes place, then the, the war is over at that point. Well, we know the Germans are forced to, to, to be halted. And after the Battle of Ypres, especially, first Ypres, November 22nd, 1914, what hardens in the West? Of course, that trench line, the, trench, the famous trench warfare that we discussed last class from the English Channel to the Switzerland, Swiss border. That's in the West. Well, what happens at this exact same time in the East? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So first thing on the board, what do I have? I don't even know what I have on the board. I didn't write this stuff yesterday. Um, uh, unnamed people did. I can't, I can't talk, I can't say who did. Uh, Eastern Front begins August 17th, German attack into Russia. Is that 1915? 1914. 1914. This is all 1914. No, no, it's okay. Thank you. Please be unconfused by asking questions like that. That's excellent. Please always ask, don't, don't assume. Uh, we, are in, we are in the beginning part of the war. Again, look, like I said, this is lecture number two, really. Of, it's lecture eight of the class, but two of the war lectures. The first war lecture, please note mentally or by pen or by tablet, um, that the, the first part of the lecture was the Western Front, right? The Western Front from August, from August 1st, from the opening of the Battle of Frontiers through the Christmas troops, right? That's the Western Front. Today, we're talking about the Eastern Front at the same time period. Okay, well, we'll go ahead a little bit. You're gonna see some 15 dates on there, but it's basically just the first part of the war on that side. Okay, Eastern Front begins August 17th when Germany attacks Russia. There's some person, I don't know her name. She's very, very sweet and nice, and I feel bad. I can't ask her now. I've talked to her a couple of times, told me about things. I don't know her name. But I was walking yesterday and she comes by. It was really sweet. Hello, I had a coffee with you. I called attention to it and it reduced the level of embarrassment for me. Um, anyways, Germany's not waiting, I guess, Maria, right? They're not, they're not freaking waiting. This is what Wyoming would do if people in spirit of were having a rebellion. They would attack South Dakota immediately. Um, that's what they're gonna do. Like, we don't have time. There's two minor battles that commence this Eastern attack. And by the way, can I please make one point? In German, when you see someone like von Moltke, von Falkenheim, what does that mean? Well, what, is that, well, what does that signify? Kind of nobility, kind of an aristocratic flavor class, okay? Von Hindenburg. A lot of these people were from East Prussia. Where is East Prussia today, in many ways? Are we talking about East Prussia? Romania. No. You're too south from Romania. Yeah. It's a good guess. I'm serious. So much of this stuff is Europe itself is just completely convoluted, right? Countries are so small and so it's like, I mean, you're not far away. Poland, basically. All that stuff we'll talk about today is in Poland. Now, I, I, I you know, I am Polish. My mother is born in Poland. I, I love Poland. Um, that's, that has nothing to do with whatever. Who cares? But uh, Poland is off the map at this time. Please understand, I hear the Battle of Warsaw. Warsaw is the modern nation, but Warsaw is the capital of Poland. Um, the best city in Poland is a city called Krakow, or as Americans say, Krakow. Uh, maybe you've heard of this city. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. But a lot of this, these battles take place kind of in this general area that becomes Poland. Why is Poland off the map? Well, I'll tell you why. Who, who can tell me why? Why is there no Poland at this time? A lot of these battles are gonna happen in Poland, which is called, called East Russia. And, uh, you know, why is there no Poland? Do know? Hasn't there been no Poland for a long time? There has. And I, I'm being, I've been invited by Protestants to give a talk on Poland. I'm going to drop so much Catholicism on their thick skulls. I'm just going to need to, I don't know what happened. They've been pulling Catholicism out their nose for weeks on end. No long, we're going to have long Catholicism symptoms. We drop so much of the faith on them. Um, we need to give you an appropriate sweatshirt to wear here. I'm all, I, I, I literally, yeah, I went in for a brain scan the other day and my head, my brain is shaped like a cougar, Betsy, like it's part of my DNA. <laughs> Actually, part, part of my mRNA, I got a vaccine made with cougar DNA. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as I hoped, I wanted this, it is turning me into a cougar man. So this is good. Man, All is going as planned. How's that working? Good. <laughs> How's it working now? And the question is that. Good. Yeah, I can't go. Oh, 
You're it's like really Wally Mammoth. Yeah. Better than that. I know what you're talking about it, but no, more. more. Okay. Why is there no Poland for this time? Well, I'll tell you why. I freaking tell you why. Poland arguably was the most important country between in Europe between the 14th and 15th century when it was this massive conglomerate called the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. In fact, which was born in 1571. In fact, Russians, who Poles hate, and it's very mutual, but it's kind of funny, and we really don't, but it's that kind of thing. It's a lot of different things. Russians date their independence day from the Battle of Kushino and the, the founding of the Romanov dynasty when Poles had almost captured Moscow, not Idaho, Russia. And, <laughs> and the, the Poles were, were, were repelled. Poland used to be the main central European power. And then in uh, beginning in 1773 and 1793 and 95, Poland was partitioned, torn apart by three powers, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. And so cities in the South, like my favorite Polish city, Krakow, became you know, German speaking, became part of the Austrian Hungarian Empire. A lot of Poles will fight for the central powers. While the Poles in the Eastern part of Poland, I still talk about the siege of Przemysl, um, whereas um, they're number five. They are part, part of Russia and some parts go to Germany. So East Prussia, this area often, the whole battlefield, the Eastern Front kind of is, is modern day Poland. Um, Poles famous to say Maria Teresa was um, a pro-Polish Austrian emperor, right? Okay. But she still did the partition. The famous saying is, um, she cried, but she still took. I don't want to do this. I don't want to tear apart your country. I, I don't. I said, you know, as I took it all. Okay. Tessie, I don't want to drink your coffee. Tessie, I don't. Tessie, please. I'm sorry. It's so rude of me. That kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a French class yesterday. None of you came. Sad. And I have a friend in class, and I asked her a few times if I could have a sip of her coffee. And she's so nice. Yeah, of course, this is just a joke. She would have offered to me. This is really nice, but we are in a pandemic. So I had to say no. <laughs> Maria, right? It's not, we can't share coffee in times of pandemic, right? That's what I think. So the, 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 uh, <laughs> Are you thinking about your? I'm not. I don't know. Are you I having your? Your Ivan This is this is not. Okay. <laughs> Two small battles. Okay. Stalhoponin and Gumbinin. Okay, in the Eastern Front, August 17th and 20th, respectively. Let's see what happens in these battles. Well, this first one, Stalhoponin, is a minor German success. Okay, a minor German success, but it does little to kind of like throw off the Russian plans. Now remember. To be as clear as possible, think of the Schlieffen plan. Think of Germany here, six weeks in the West. We talked about the West already. And now what do we do with this back door through what is today modern day Poland, East Prussia with the Russians? This is the first clash of this. As this as Stolopin is happening August 17th, the Germans are kicking butt in Belgium. Please, I'm going to keep reminding you, keep fo focus on what's going on in two fronts. This is August 17th. This is still three weeks before September 5th, the opening of the Battle of the Marne. These are happening at the same time. August 20th, though, is a clear German loss, okay, at Gumbinen. Okay, it's a complete kind of disaster. And Moltke, Helmuth von Moltke, the guy who will have a nervous breakdown at the Marne and is removed on September 9th and replaced by who? Eric von Falkenheim. He is still in charge, and he fires this guy named Pritwitz. Okay, this German general named Pritwitz, P-R-I-2-T-W-I-T-Z. Pritwitz. Pritwitz is the first command casualty of the Great War, the first general to be fired. Okay, Germans have no tolerance for failure, right? These first two battles, you can see, are kind of or bad for the Germans. Despite Stalupin and being a German victory, it's, it's a, nothing happens. They just kind of they punch each other lightly, whatever. The plans aren't disrupted. Gumbinen is a clear Russian victory, also small scale, but the Germans are like, no. Who do you think replaces Pritwitz? I'm going to give you, the, if you know this answer, I'm going to be super impressed because these names will become more and more familiar as we get into the class. Right now, they're still not that familiar. It's the same guy who was a hero two weeks earlier in the Western Front. Who is this person? Who's going to take over for Pritwitz? The doorman? Yeah, Ludendorff. So, Cecily, you hear the story, but it's a really cool story. Eric Ludendorff is arguably the the, the Napoleon of the First World War. He's a really bad reputation after war because he's an ardent Hitler supporter. Nazi party guy. And uh, to his credit, before he died, I said, I always tell the story, right? 
to that he denounces Hitler, of course, that since he's man ruin our country and stuff. So okay. But Ludendorff will become de facto like generalissimo of Germany in 1916. We're future tripping a little bit, but later in the war, Ludendorff will become uh, the kind of command, the, 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 the full commander of the country, not just the army. In the Western Front, before the Germans start, shells into, uh, into the forest explosion, the Belgians look kind of like this, gumbin in. The, the Germans uh, suffer some setbacks, right? So the famous story, the door knock, when he's talking about Ludendorff goes in the battlefield, he's like, what, what's going on? He planned this thing, and most generals stay behind the lines. And he said, like, what's, what's going on? Who's in charge? And that guy was, he's dead. Ludendorff personally takes command, personally goes up to the a Belgian fort, knocks on the door with a sword, and inside are a thousand guys. He's like, I need you to surrender immediately. They point their sword at guys with guns. They do it. Like, this guy is such freaking a word I can't say. Um, a certain male uh, organ. And I guess we have to, like, wow. He has a massive intestinal fortitude to do something like this, to try to surrender for his guns with a sword, right? Uh, surrender, boom, right? What are you talking about? They surrender because that's just so brave. Well, Ludendorff, after winning amazing fame in the West, and he gets double fame in the West, because guess what? Not only did he do the door knocking, Ludendorff's also the guy who planned the Western stuff. So when he turns the tide with the surrenders from fort, the Germans start really kicking butt. It's like, well, that's Ludendorff's plan. So it's double. He planned it and he's in the battlefield. And then he gets put in charge in the East. Ludendorff takes command on August 22nd. And he's about to get bonkers level famous. He's, again, I mentioned Justin Bieber before. Ludendorff's about to get like 100 million of what happens here in the East. But it's not just him. And, and if I'm, I'm telling you the answer right, this is going to be a massive German victory. Tannenberg is one of the most, one of the clearest victories in World War I. World War I, what does it equal? I remember Groshen, it's attrition, where no one wins, everyone dies, it's extremely sad, right? This is one of the few battles that it's like, it is absolutely clear. It is the way the Vandals, when they, when they beat Simon Fraser, and made fun of Simon Fraser, because their name is the Clan, stupidest football name. Like you literally could, you lose 68 to nothing, it's bad enough. Your name is like the Scottish Clan, like could that be more cool? Like that's, wow, I'm sorry. Um, this is like a 68 to nothing victory over Simon Fraser. Okay, it's gonna be a clear victory in Ludendorff, right? Now you're putting the pieces together. How does he become Generalissimo Napoleon dictator guy in Germany? Well, at the start of the war, he's the guy that plans special frontiers battle. Unlike other generals who chill behind enemy lines and just eat their nice food, he actually goes on the battlefield, does the ultimate brave thing. Talk about like, you know, I would attack the gates of hell with that man. It's kind of like military cliche, but yeah, right? He's like Alexander the Great, he's out in front, and now he's gonna go to win this great victory in the East. And it's incredible. Let me tell you again, though, uh, as people can imagine, people in power often have, we know, one thing that's very, very good. There's a lot of temptations with power, but people in power often don't struggle with ego. Um, right? Or <laughs> completely opposite. In, in, in all of like life, people say generals are the most egotistical people of all time. Because they have this power, they, they, they think they have this power over life or death. They do in some scary way. They can send people to die from many causes. Remember what Ludendorff said. Ludendorff is the hero of the West, but he gets sent to the East. He's kind of angry about this. He thinks I should be running the whole show. Falkenheim gets put in charge of the West. Remember what Ludendorff said about Falkenheim. He says, quote, I am only capable of two emotions, love and hate. And I hate General Falkenheim. <laughs> but these guys are supposed to be like, you know, they're supposed to, they're together, they're on the same team. He's like, like the offensive coordinator of Washington State being like, I'm only capable of love and hate. And I hate that coach. Like, that's like pretty, that's pretty dissension in the ranks, right? That's not good. <laughs> we did a whole movie about Nick Rolovich in this class. Do you know this Rolovich saga? No? Rolovich is the head football coach of Washington State. He's refusing to get the vaccine. Oh, I guess. And I'm not saying that's good or bad. For the official sources. This morning? No. No. Okay. I can show the Rolovich video again for Cecily. She wants to see it at the end of class. You probably should. She wants to see it at the end of class. That's a silent film theory. That's one of those silent films. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know. Big star. Big Hmm. What are you talking about? Go okay. How much is good as Charlie Chaplin? I'm better, I think. Uh, well, um, 
How is it something really awkward and funny, but I can't think of anything. So, too bad. Okay. <laughs> Well, that was one out of two. No, it's interesting. I'm looking at this map, and it's showing that it's two days by rail from Gumbinen, or however you said that, mm -hmm. to um, Cannonburg. Right. Well, yeah, the, I mean, but so the battle ends on the 20th. It starts on the 23rd, so you have three days already. And a lot of the people arriving to the, the big part of the battle will turn on August 26th, 27th. So you have about the battle itself. Also think often, like, if any of you are we're going to do next spring in class of the Civil War, which is my ultimate special. I can't wait. Seriously, it's like I, I love the Great War, but Civil War is like that's my professional, like if, that's my neurosurgery kind of thing that I went to medical school for. Um, so I, I probably know more about the historic than any other topic. That's all. I've you know, dedicated 10 years of my life to it. If you know about the Battle of Gettysburg, the kind of turning point in the Civil War, obviously, the big important day is July 3rd, 1863, Pickett's Charge, but the battle is dated to the first. There's like stupid skirmishing. And God rest all people's souls that died in stupid skirmishes. It's disrespectful for me to say it, but it's not like there's things that like it counted as part of the battle, but whatever. Same thing with Tannenberg. The skirmishing and stuff's hard. The big events happen late by, you know, 27, 28, 29 in his name. I know that for, for, for battle terms often. They'll date from like when the first shots are fired, but often the decisive stuff are on, on one specific day, whatever it may be. So there's plenty of time for people to make these, these, these true movements, even within two days. Um, okay, Battle of Tannenberg. So first thing, 2A, there's early Russian success, okay? Early Russian success. But the Russians act what can be described as impetuously. What does it mean to be impetuous? Dave Schmidt has lived every, made every decision in his life in impetuous fashion. What does it mean? Living the way I drive, with reckless abandon. Reckless abandon, not thinking it through, acting on your passions and emotions. Um, I saw a bumper sticker in Moscow, but I don't know if I can repeat it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can repeat it. Tell me after the, when the Zoom is off, I'll repeat it to you guys. <laughs> I'm serious. Remind me the Zoom. I don't want this on camera. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, hey, guys. Hey, everyone listening. Hey, everybody in China, wherever. I'm not going to repeat stuff on the camera. Um, when the Zoom goes off, remind me. Tell me the bumper sticker. Okay, this is, this is a real bummer. I, I didn't make this up. I it's not mine. I just read it in traffic. The Russians are acting impetuous. Who do you think is whose fault is it? I, I want you to really think critically. I'm serious. Really get deep down and think. Think about all the stuff we've covered. I've given you so much detail, maybe too much at times. Think about the July crisis. Think about the formation of alliances. Who is pressuring the Russians to act in impetuous fashion? Oh. The Ottomans. The Ottomans are a joke. Okay. And they're the enemies of the Russians. Oh. So over to you. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about the Ottomans too. We'll talk about the Russians fighting the Ottomans. I think I've never laughed so hard in my life before when I was talking about the Russians fighting the Ottomans being their hobby, uh, being them in battle. That really made me laugh a lot. Remember, but it's on tape. We'll go back and look at the tape and verify it. Who is pressuring the Russians, Betsy? The British. No, not the British. Mm -hmm. it's Gotta be France. 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 Remember, remember when Poincaré was in Saint Petersburg uh, in, in, during the July crisis and trying to like, hey, this is our moment, right? Guess what? Franco-Prussian War. We can get back Alsace-Lorraine, right? Let's do this, guys. Us and Russia. We'll get back Alsace-Lorraine, and then you guys can you guys can take back Istanbul. You can get the Straits. You can take it from the Ottomans. You can make bring back Russian Orthodox Byzantium. French are. French are telling the Russians, go, 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 do something, help us. Right? And that's understandable. You know, foil the Schlieffen plan. Let's open the two front now, the Germans will be enveloped and crushed. But it's bad for, for, for Russian tactics. You know what's worse for Russian tactics? Besides being Russian, uh, putting your message, message in the clear. What does that mean? Uh, does that mean that you let the whole world know? Basically. And as we know, Germans have a couple of reputations. Germans are one, not known for their intelligence, not good at engineering, not good at tech. So they probably won't intercept this, right? And obviously being sarcastic on all points, right? The Germans are the best at like breaking code and whatever. Maybe the, the British as well. I mean, the Benedict Cumberbatch was in a movie about some guy who broke a code, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> This is already like the Russians, it's already a good chance the Germans are going to break your code no matter what. 
What do I mean by code? It's just very simple. If I'm getting messages, like Cecily is my other commander in the battlefield. I can't say, hey, Cecily, attack at eight o'clock. I got to say like, you know, nine, five, six, eight, what, whatever. Like I got to, it's like uh, signs in baseball or football plays. You can go to a football game and there's dudes on the side and they have like, they're holding up weird posters and stuff. A lot of those signs are dummy signs. I'm the quarterback. I know that the real sign is coming from Sophie. But everyone else is holding, everyone's holding smoke and they're just trick the opposition. Only I know which one I should read and what it actually means and whatever. That's, that's the whole thing of kind of encoding your messages. The Russians don't do that. They have their messages in the clear. So the Germans, they can't believe it. Like, are they trolling us? Are, are they like reverse psychologizing us? Like they're doing this on purpose to make us think? But it turns out, no. So the biggest problem with Tannenberg is that they're, they're, they, they have early success for the Russians. They're overextended. Overextended equals what? What is the great phrase? Blank and blank. I know this is not helping you at all. But in general, an enemy wants to do blank and blank. What, what is it? <laughs> Thank you. You're freaking yeah. brilliant. <laughs> I don't know how you got that. That was the worst, that was the worst like Vanna White. You know, but <laughs> here, there's no hint. <laughs> what is it? It's blank, you know. Divide and conquer, perfect. They're overextended, so these two armies split. The, the two generals, the two generals you have to know who are in charge of the Russians are one is named Samsonov, and the other, I kid you not, is Renenkampf. Renenkampf is like a German name. It's like his name might as well be Germany, German pride. And he comes from, a, this is again, though, about this idea of, of smashed up Europe. There's tons of people in Russia who come from German stock, including the empress. That's why she gets all this kind of later on stuff with Rasputin. We're going to have a whole class just on Rasputin, where, where she's a German agent because she is German. Because she, she is German, right? The, the Germans, the Russians share this common border, especially post partition of Poland. Renenkampf, he, as I put an R next to him, just to remind you, he is not a German general. He's German as all get out, but he's, he's German stock. Like, like my name, Krzyzewski, I'm super Polish, but I'm an American, right? Um, if, if Poland was fighting American, they'd be like, well, he's of course a Polish general, but I'm an American. Renenkampf is a German dude of st German stock. He was made in a BMW factory, he's a cyborg, but he's actually Russian. Renenkampf and Samsonov, their armies get split up, okay? And so what happens pretty quick is that Germans exploit the split maneuver. Ludendorff and Hindenburg uh, do, this is gonna be brilliant. I just thought it's now, it's cool. Cool, cool moment of life inspiration. They do a mini Schlieffen plan. The Schlieffen plan they couldn't enact on a big scale, which was take the French out before the Russians mobilize. They do here, take out Samsonov and then deal with Renenkampf. Okay, they, 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 they brilliantly accomplish it. They, in fact, they, in fact, at one point, uh, by, by late in this timeline, by August 28th, they have completely encircled the army of Samson, which is terrifying, okay? That my army is here, and I, and I mean, I mean, just, I mean, just, right? Just very, very scary, bad stuff. When you hear the stats soon, and by that stuff, I mean a complete rout. This clearly is a very exceptional battle in the First World War because it is a clear, clear, clear. There's no argument here. Well, we don't know. Even the Marne, it's definitely an Allied victory because the war doesn't end and Paris is saved, but it's kind of, again, attrition, equal losses, and just kind of a bunch of like a stalemate kind of. World War I equals stalemate. I said one of the greatest paradoxes of World War I, as I announced in NASA that one time at the end of this, nothing, I think, has shaped our last hundred years as much as this conflict. So many things, so much of our philosophy, things on the ground, again, Our Lady of Fatima, there's so many important things that come out of the World War, World War I era. The effects are so <laughs> dynamic, but the battles itself often were so static. And so nothing, it's just bloody stalemate. Annenberg is not like that. Okay, Renenkampf is forced to retreat, all right? Samsonov, sadly, in this kind of honor culture, he goes in the woods and commits suicide, the one general. His body is found later in the Red Cross, takes it back to, to Russia. He honestly feels like I've let the Tsar down. I, I can't live with myself. Samson goes in the woods and kills himself. Uh, Renekamp uh, does not, thankfully, uh, but he retreats to fight another day, but only after, because again, Samson's army is the one that's really just like blown up. Renekamp, his army loses, but he still has some moving parts to, to retreat from the battle. Oh, wait, now I'm confused. Which of these is the first army and which is the second army? Of don't, the don't worry about that. Don't worry about the names. Like the, 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 I think the German army is the eighth army and stuff. Don't worry about the names. Um, I, I think Samsonov uh, 
was in charge of the first army, Renekamp the second. There's even like on the, I didn't even give these names on the, the Western front for, for, for the purpose of, it's already confusing enough, but like, for instance, on the Western front, I think Alexander von Kluck was head of the German first army and I think Boulot perhaps was the second. These are just military nerd kind of terms. You can know them and look them up. Don't worry about it. I would just, I, would, I think the generals are enough and just the, the description of battle is basic enough, right? Like if I was teaching this class at West Point or military academy, I would have to have every last button fastened on the actual names of the armies, the, the divisions, right? Division has 50,000 men, how many people are there? I'm more interested in ideological larger stuff than, it's a great question, but again, I would say it's like here, you know, Hindenburg reports that three Russian corps, the 13th, 15th, and 18th had been destroyed. Does that help you that three corps in the Roman numeral teenage numbers are, that, that seems like it's more confusing than anything. Just know- The really cool thing there is that, that um, the 29th of August, it says that uh, with the Russian second army, 150,000 troops outflanked. Right, so then actually I have the number here, but Samson out in the second one, right in first. My mistake, I had it backwards. Yeah, no, com completely outflanked and surrounded onto almost, there's a famous battle in 216 BC where the Carthaginians during the Punic War totally surround the Romans at Ocne and just, just God of mercy, they just eat them down to nothing, you know, it's whatever. It's just not as brutal as that. They surrender, it's not down to the last man, but Samson's army is completely, completely destroyed. Now, History and fame for the, let's, let's read the stats first. Let's do two F first, the stats, right. Okay, so Samsonov, in charge of the second army, it's almost completely annihilated his army. 92,000 men are captured. That was 100,000 men are captured. Again, it's more than the combined population of Moscow, Poland, and almost adding the least in it. Imagine all the people in those places are captured in, in one week long event. 78,000 killed or wounded. The Russians lose 350 guns, artillery pieces. Crazy, this is a big loss. This isn't like, oh, no big deal. I'm thinking like they lose 350 pistols, uh, artillery, huge, like big burst of pieces. The Germans, out of 150,000 men, only suffer 12,000 casualties. Every one of those 12,000 casualties is sad, it's tragic, good for the families. As a military general, that's amazing. So again, that's, that's, that's losing, winning a football game 70 to 14. You get up two touchdowns. Well, I wish it was 70 to zero, but it's pretty freaking good, right? And uh, okay, so. The, 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 the crazy thing is, in order to take the Russian equipment back to Germany, 60 trains are required. The Germans have to dedicate 60 trains to take the, the, the booty, the war booty, the, the war spoils back to Germany, all these guns and weapons and stuff. It is a crushing, crushing, crushing victory. Back in those days, um, 100,000 or 92,000, whatever you said, um, captured. How do they manage? such a huge number of people as prisoners you know well what, what did they do a lot of times well i'm not so much sure about like camps and stuff like that but you, you had what was kind of and holding pen as well so sounds so humanizing but they, they captured they surrendered there's thank god this kind of basic out to even humanitarian for your military a code of honor you don't shoot someone's unarmed are unarmed they just forced them to march somewhere you guys are just gonna stay here and the idea was well let's say you know, hundred thousand men in this, in this holding area in this camp again yeah, that's probably the only word you can say but like the, the pow camp maybe only 200 german guards are assigned they all have machine guns but they're, or they're not you know they're gonna stay there and it's, and it's kind of assumed like this sucks i'm captured but there's rules of war i'll be eventually paroled or whatever at the end of the conflict and the conditions are horrible. Maybe and some of these later in the war, we can't even feed our own arms. What do you think it's like for POWs? Right. They're not going to go anywhere. They give their weapons. They try to leave, they'll be shot, right? And just so I think a lot of it is psychological. Like we lost the war, we surrendered. This is this is pro forma. Well, we, we march now. That's of course. We'll stop option. We run away and get shot in the back, you know, clean. Um, so but, but that definitely was itself a problem, of course. Again, like imagine Hindenburg at Ludendorff. We'll talk about Hindenburg in a second. If you, you might have heard of him, if not, we'll you know, talk about him in a second. They, they both, this is number eight. History and fame for Hindenburg and Ludendorff, that team. Ludendorff, you know why, right? I'm giving you three reasons on Ludendorff. We'll talk about Hindenburg in a second. Um, the, uh, the whole, when, when, when they institute something called the, the war economy, that's going to dedicate every, every ounce of the German home front in 1960 to feeding the soldiers to doing almost what 
the women in factories did in World War II, the Rosie River, transforming everything to munitions. It's going to be really bad for the capture of POW because we can't get our own people, right? So this becomes a huge problem in that sense. We have to humanely treat our prisoners. That's by international code, et cetera. By, by forget all that. By, by human nature, we're just people, right? We're a hated enemy. But what can we do? We can't even feed our own soldiers. So it, it, you're right. It becomes very, very problematic in so many ways. Sadly, for these people that would be bad, if we all just fought to the death and died in the battlefield. So we have to be prisoners, kind of thing, right? Okay. Ludendorff, again, this makes his star like through the hemisphere. But equally, Paul von Hindenburg, actually, who's seen as kind of the old titan of the German army, maybe gets even the greatest, our greatest credit for uh, the victory at Tannenberg specifically, which by the way, what does the Tannenbaum mean? Oh, Tannenbaum, oh, Tannenbaum. What kind of tree? Baum, Baum, yeah, Tannenbaum is literally a Christmas tree. This is the battle of Christmas trees, okay? In 1415, the Teutonic Knights, the kind of predecessors of the Germans, I think get their butt kicked by Poles, by Polish people um, at Tannenberg. And Hindenburg is like, uh, we're not close to Hindenburg. Let's name it that because we're banned. Imagine if we Muscovites lost the Battle of Lewiston 200 years ago. And today we beat Lewiston in Colfax. I'm like, yeah, second battle, Lewiston. It's not, it's Colfax. We're going to name it that. This is just a flourishing touch. Right? Be like um, the battle, that, what, what's, a, what's, a, what's a war in America? The battle, the battle of the Alamo. Imagine we get revenge in Oklahoma and we call it the Second Battle of the Alamo. It's just meant, it's meant to connect you, like this is payback for that, but it's not the same. It's actually 20 months away. But I'll show you a map in a second soon where, where this is. But uh, you know, all of this, remember, it's on the eastern border, East Prussia, which they bought in Poland, in that area, the Poland, which they separate, right? Germany from Belarus, and then the Russia proper. That, that's the whole area we're talking about here. I'll show you many maps. All for Betsy Jones, committed lover of cartography. Uh, <laughs> lots of fame, especially for Hindenburg. Hindenburg has some interesting history, because unlike Ludendorff, who denounces Hitler, Hindenburg will become president of Germany after the war, and he's the one who signs the enabling act, making Hitler Fuhrer. He, he kind of so like, yeah, great, you can be everything, chancellor, prime minister, whatever. So people often look at Hindenburg as the handmaiden for Hitler's rise to power, to become who he was. And then he dies shortly after that. Hindenburg does. Hitler just and Fuhrer means leader in, in Germany because the, the the guy, right? So Hindenburg does not have perhaps that moment of redemption. Now, remember I talked about generals hating each other, right? There's this subcommander named Hoffman who doesn't get a lot of credit. He's pissed, for lack of a better word. So later on, he goes, and about Hindenburg, he says this. Oh, yeah, Hindenburg. He's our, he's our uh, great leader. Well, let me show you the battle of the battlefield. Here, he says, quote, this is where uh, the field marshal slept before the battle. This is where he slept after the battle. This is where he slept during the battle. <laughs> right? He's like, oh, he got all the credit. Like, I did the work. I, Hoffman, right? And uh, Hindenburg says, well, no, quote, if the battle had gone badly, the name Hindenburg would have been reviled from one, germ one end of Germany to the other. He's actually right. Mm -hmm. A kind of cult of personality develops around Hindenburg after this battle. Like he's the great father of nations, like a George Washington kind of thing. This is his crossing the Delaware moment. Mm -hmm. And he's right, okay? But Ludendorff's like, no, 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 I deserve the credit. Ludendorff's like, my encircling movement was the thing that cost the victory. He says, on August 26th, Hindenburg and I had dinner and I proposed the encircling movement. And <laughs> Hindenburg later, not only does he remove Hoffman from his memoirs, Hoffman <laughs> said, I saw tears, he thought he wasn't there. <laughs> he photoshopped him out of the thing. Yeah, he says later, well, I don't want to talk bad, but <laughs> Ludendorff was in a state of panic. <laughs> so, like these guys are such like tools, you know. They're such power hungry. Me, me, me. <laughs> oh, he did it. He was asleep. Oh, he was asleep. Well, he had a nervous breakdown, you know. Like, and then and then Hindenburg goes <laughs> in one of these moments where I'm kind of like patting you on the head and eat your milk and cookies. And he's like talking to all people wanted, all the haters. He goes, after all, I know something about this business. I was instructor in tactics at the War Academy. Don't you forget? <laughs> So, we have any doubts? Remember who is the president? <laughs> you guys are the worst. You guys are the most baby back female dog 
kind of people who are like, oh, you know, the most, they have the greatest, like, those are genius in some ways, the freaking most fragile egos. <laughs> people, the Hindenburg is angry because historians give Ludendorff credit. That doorknock guy, he actually was a genius. He was probably the best gen on the whole world. One of them. Ludendorff did do the encircling move. Hindenburg was like, oh, you say he did? Well, let me tell you a story. He actually, he was scared. He cried. The thing, before the thing you know, whatever. Maybe that's what we've learned in a way over time. You know, we have, we, we look back at our great battles and we have one general. Yeah, I mean, sure. Which versus is, having too many cooks in the kitchen. Too. Yeah, which is not fair, right? Exactly. I mean, who knows? Like maybe Trish Schmidt, who's the lieutenant at this battle, she's actually the absolute turning point. But it's like whatever, just uh, work it upwards to the main commander. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's that is absolutely true. I I heard a story. Yeah, it's like Jordan Washington. Like apparently that <laughs> during one of the important battles, the Battle of Saratoga, he was playing video games <laughs> in his tennis. <laughs> in his tennis. <laughs> he no, was playing that's, PlayStation 2. That's, that's not true. He was watching Netflix. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He was binge watching The Good Wife on Netflix. <laughs> Anybody see that show? Who knows The Good Wife? The guy, his, this guy named Kerry Agos. He's a lawyer. He's a really good looking dude. My goal is to become Kerry Agos. Become The Good Wife. Um, <laughs> he says, no. Uh, by the way, you wouldn't see Mel Gibson's thing the other day. Uh, <laughs> okay. Three seconds to our Seth, I freaking promise. You. Oh, it's all serious. Seth is like, I come to this class, I get this. So <laughs> I thought you were here to keep him. Yeah. I know. You know, I should bring my phone card that's for a real long one so I can look up everything you say that's off the topic. No. Um, anyways. <laughs> so anyways, really cool. No. Okay. So who here does not know what the word based means? You know, who don't, be, be honest. We know what based means. Okay. So like, it means like in our culture, it's like the opposite of woke. So woke is like, I'm really like, you know, into like new movements, whatever. It's like based in tradition, like feet, two feet on the ground, based in reality. Oh, I thought you were talking about the turkey. Yeah, I was thinking. <laughs> not, not, no, I think good. No, not, not basted, based, B-A-S-E, -E, like, based on the ground, based in reality. A woke person is like a super a utopian, whatever, but if you're super based, and it's often you, woke is super left, based is super like all right, okay, whatever. You'll see why I define this in a second. Mel Gibson, I'm not gonna comment if I like him or not. I do find him hilarious. He's a professional actor. I think I told a story earlier. Uh, Twitter went crazy because uh, Trump was walking down and Mel Gibson literally, I think on purpose to troll people, was like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, people are like, look, Mel Gibson is a, a coal, he's a coal follower, like, you know, whatever, like, he is so exaggerated, stupid, you know, whatever. And Trump, of course, was, you know, whatever. Well, Mel Gibson released a video two days ago, you can look on it, denouncing, like, the church recently and stuff. So Mel Gibson is a Catholic in progress, you know, whatever, but like, he says whatever, um, you just watch it on, on Twitter. I'm not saying I support or disagree with his message, you decide. But Mel Gibson goes and does this two-minute clip on Twitter. And the funniest comment was, so the person reposting it, could Mel Gibson be any more base? <laughs> it was like, you decide. You watch this video. You tell me what you can have your charger, your cord, you can verify it or not. But Mel Gibson did a talk on, on the state of the church and, like, per persecuted priests, priests who have been, like, removed, whatever. And to make a long story short, uh, really kind of traditionalist Catholics are like, this is the greatest thing ever. And real progressive Catholics are like, they hate Mel Gibson, he's awful. There's more evidence he's crazy. That's kind of what I got from the Catholic Twitter sphere is like, if you're a left leaning Catholic, you hate this video. If you're right, you like it, you decide. Uh, okay. But it was important to mention it, even though you don't have any opinion. It's funny. It was five minutes of no problem. I just find it. Yeah, it was. It was like a Biden speech. Um, okay, Battle of Lemberg. Now, this is again. Now, guys, okay, time out. Wow, everybody, hold up. Not hold up. Drop the B out of E apostrophe. Everyone, hold up. Okay. At this time right here, Cecily, who is winning the war? Let's say by August 30th. Who is clearly freaking the war? Germany, big time. Yeah. This is still a week. Remember, I want you to always think Western Front. This is a week before the Marne. People right now, this is a panic time for the Allies. 
August 30th, the Russians just got their butt, like not kicked, like removed and handed on a silver platter. That's the czar. Like you guys are a joke. This is a preview of what's going to happen the rest of the war. Russians are annihilated. This not only makes up for this, it's like a million times making up for this. It looks like a little mommy, I have a boom, I need a band-aid after a kiss. Like this isn't a defeat, it's like no big deal, a scratch. This is like annihilation. While they're annihilating in the East, they're blowing up every fort in the West and threatening Paris. Keep in mind, as the calendar turns to September, the Allies are like, we're beat. Our goose is cooked, and now we're bringing it full circle. It's basted like a turkey. <laughs> about basted. That was basted. Now the freaking Ludendorff is laying in that, I got my baby back, baby back. Baby. He's like, play it on. Chili's baby back ribs. That's what the Germans are doing at this point. I'm not just quoting history. <laughs> It's can be over at this point. Um, but let's see what... <laughs> where were the main battles in the east where, where Russia got so Tannenberg, 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 Tannenberg. I'm oh. just talking about Tannenberg. All right. I'm just talking about oh, Tannenberg. Right. I'll see the map in. I have a cooler map than you, Betsy. Yeah. Betsy, but just know forever. You have the same map just know that? whatever you do, it'll never be as good as what I do. Just keep it. That's a good operating system to work you with. You know, I think I should take him down because I think he is lost. <laughs> <laughs> That's like one step removed. I'm going to have you look down this canyon and then <laughs> I'm going to hit you in the back of the head. And <laughs> <you won't talk. laughs> you are brilliant one You are hilarious. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Battle of Lemberg. Okay, now in parentheses, Lvov. This is one of the, Lvov is actually today spelled, if you want to go to Lvov, Cecily, you want to take a trip there. L-V-I-V, Lviv it is in U the Ukraine today, but it's a very famous old Polish city. And at this point, Lemberg is the German name. This is the point I made earlier. This East Prussia area is Poland, Germany, Russia, it's everything. Dave Schmidt is redeeming himself more and more by the minute when he mistakenly said Romania. And yet he, the point was so well taken. It's like, everything is like, completely combined at this point. It's all like one kind of smoothie blending together. At the Battle of Lemberg, this is a Russian victory for the Allies. Coming at a good time. Coming at a good time, right? By September 11th, right? That, that, that you know, God rest all their souls apropos of the 20 year anniversary. For us as Americans, September 11th is one thing, always only one thing. I'm asking you to disassociate that for a second. September 11th is the day before the Battle of the Marne is decided. This part where it's, I got my Chili's baby back ribs, is two weeks later like, okay, the Western Front has been hardened, Paris is safe, and now our allies, the Russians, I'm speaking from the Allied side, are making some progress. Lemberg is a victory for the Russians. Do you know who, uh, who is the losing general? This is Russia defeats Austria-Hungary. The Germans will eventually say, being allies of Austria-Hungary is like being shackled to a corpse, right? They're like, they, they don't look highly upon Austrian-Hungarian allies. They, the Austria-Hungary is always losing. It's our friend, who's that? the Germans, the German high command, say that Austria Hungary would be better if they weren't around. All you do is lose and cause us to send more help. Conrad, remember Conrad von Hotzendorf? What do you remember about Conrad von Hotzendorf? He's the, he's the generalissimo, the leader of the Austrian army. What do I tell you about him? He's one of the main characters, so do his picture. It's a semi decent looking guy, not bad looking, because um, that matters. I just judge people by their looks, I'm sorry. Um, character and qualities don't matter, just look. Um, what what did Conrad? Who, what was what was he about? Remember what did I compare him to? Anyone remember? So he's frantically uh, very calmly searching. Yeah. He was uh, he was a neocon. Remember he suggests war with Serbia twenty five times. And remember he was mm -hmm. kind of right. unfortunately ruled by his passions. He wanted to have this adulterous liaison like steal this guy's wife. Remember he said like if I start this war, I'll be a great war hero. Then she'll love me because women that's all they want to see is prowess and <laughs> Um so anyways, he is always pushing ahead. He lives by a social Darwinist philosophy, Conrad. He's like the only offensive, only defense in life is offense. So in many ways, a lot of the Austrian great failures are this thing right here, overextension, pushing ahead too far, getting trapped, getting beat. This campaign in Lemberg, all you have to remember, please write this down to understand this is, it's unremitting retreat for the Austro-Hungarians back and across the Carpathian Mountains, okay? So as the Germans are winning on both fronts, okay, despite being held up at the Marne, they've conquered hundreds of land, hundreds of miles of territory in Belgium, and they've really handed it to the Russians. They're about to hand it to them again in a second. Missourian Lakes is the follow-up battle to Tannenberg. 
Okay, so it's not just kick their butt in tandem or go home and drink schnapps or whatever Germans drink. They go and they keep pushing their advantage. Their ally, because to remind you again, right? This war is basically Russia and France and Britain, the allies against Austria-Hungary and Germany. Italy, I love Italy. I love the Italian language. Cecily Prell is in the process. Like people are in the process of getting vaccinated. She's in the process of learning Italian. Um, and she's doing it. What do you, what did you, what time program did you choose? A Moderna or a Pfizer? What's well, something different? Oh my bad. Um, okay. I love Italy. I love Italy, but Italy is not reliable. They, they're flip flopping. They will flip flop. They have an agreement with the central powers, and pretty soon will join the, the Allied side because they want to steal Austria-Hungary's land. That's the whole basis for those twelve battles of Isonzo and that novel that I suggested you read, Hemingway's Farewell to Arms, um, which is a, a love. Story. About uh, Becca Schmidt. Um, it's just Becca Schmidt. She's she's a good guy. She's one of us. Farewell to arms. You're never gonna bleep the pot. A soldier. <laughs> I'm like, that's a great paradigm. It's awesome. If you're a soldier, like, why would you not be like, if you're a single soldier, like, just your whole goal of worship is on the first Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think so. I think a shot for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm in the trenches. Let me see. Oh, I need the fire coming. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Or wait. Wow. I'm not your nurse. Nurse. Can you send 16? Yeah. I need like 20 nurses. I'm going to take care of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, fair. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So overextension, over uh, ambition, Austro-Hungarians are forced to retreat. So as the Germans are winning, their allies are losing. Keep in mind this push and pull, whatever. In Missouri Lakes, 14 to 7 to 14 September, what is the result? You see it pretty quickly, right? Russia is expelled from East Russia. Maybe it's good. <laughs> The Marne, hey, Paris is safe, right? Paris is safe. That's great. And uh, That's fine. Yeah. I think. Okay. Sorry. It's your thing. Let's see. I will ask her for my. No, 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 don't, no, no. It's no problem. It says both are me. I don't know why it's coming through still. It's a problem for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, whatever. Back our devices. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I realized this once I tried that. I didn't want to turn the volume down and zoom air and they couldn't hear me. Right. <laughs> I input somehow. You can't have to mute, but it doesn't make connection. I no, I did. It doesn't matter really. It's it's actually it's very comforting to know there's people out there somewhere. We're not alone. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Let's freaking stop the jokes in this class. Who? I have a, should I have to show Sassy the Nick Roll video still? Come on. That's the important thing to get to. Um, I'm going to show you before you leave. Battle of Missouri and Lakes, really quickly, guys. Very simple, right? Paris is saved in the Marne. Timeline, 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 Maria. You're so good at numbers, right? 14 is two days after the Marne. Another Russian victory. The Russians are kicked out. Another German victory. The Russians are expelled from East Prussia. Okay. Then the siege of Tremisil happens. Tremisil is an absolute disaster, okay? Absolute disaster. It happens in two phases, over from September 1914 to March 1915. Tremisil, you'll see where this, this is on the map. And Tremisil, Tremisil kind of, I think, embodies so much of the First World War. This is what I want to spend the most time on in these last couple of points right here. Because Tremisil is, is a fortress, okay? And around this fortress, it's in, it's in southern Galicia. It's in, you'll see on the map soon. It'll make sense in a second, I promise. Southern Galicia on that border between Poland and Ukraine, and kind of East Prussia and all that. Around this fortress are dug, okay, 30 miles of new trenches and almost 1,000 kilometers of barbed wire, okay, to set up this, uh, to set up this military garrison of 127,000 people, okay, inside the, inside the, um, the, the fortress. Okay. In the first phase of the battle, in the first phase of the battle, which lasts in the fall of 1914, the Austro-Hungarians are going to be victorious. Okay. In the first phase of the battle, the Austro-Hungarians are going to be victorious and they will take over 
the portraits, okay? But, but because of what's going on here in this previous thing that I talked about, despite the Austro-Hungarians holding the fortress, what did I say is the result of this right here? Well, what is, what is the result? One unmitigated retreat of the Austro-Hungarians. So pretty soon, despite that we from the Austro-Hungarian uh, point of view are holding Tremesil, we are, we are losing support, we are moving backwards, we push back in these reversals here. When it's the Germans fighting the Russians, it seems it's going pretty good for central powers, Austro-Hungarians not so much. So eventually the Russians will lay siege to the fortress of Tremesil, beginning in uh, the late fall, beginning in already um, October, November. All right. On November 10th, on November 4th, citizens inside are ordered to leave and the second siege officially begins. Why is this such a good microcosm of the whole world war? Because it's it's moving back and forth, this constant flip-flopping, not a lot happening, but a lot of people dying, a lot of horrible disease, the conditions inside are absolutely terrible. But as well, because there's a lot of confusion, because of the polyglot nature of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, I mentioned this in one of the early classes, orders have to be given to the citizenry in 15 languages. This complicates already a very difficult situation. No one can understand each other, it's kind of fog of war, and in many ways, the siege embodies kind of what the whole war becomes. A lot of confusion, a lot of distraction, a lot of time spent, a lot of back and forth, and a battle that in itself has two victors, the victors being everyone who participates in the battle. The Vandals played Washington State, who won? The Vandals and Washington State, made a tie? No, they both won, they both lost. It's kind of the, the whole story of the war, all right? And what's awful is, is Tremisil becomes this early kind of flashpoint of barbarism and horridness in the city, okay? Within the city, it's basically trench writ large. Remember last class, talk about the lice and the rats and that kind of stuff. It's all that, but to make it worse, okay, there's massive outbreaks of syphilis, gonorrhea, cholera, because a lot of the people, unfortunately, I'm not trying to lay blame or be funny, this is sad, but a lot of the women who were sent to be nurses um, engage in a different profession and are literally just like, oh, soldiers. You know, seriously. And so it becomes like on top of the siege and the warfare, it becomes almost like one massive brothel in some ways. And uh, I don't know what's how you can make trench foot and this kind of stuff worse, but adding like venereal disease to, you know, it just becomes a complete disaster. In some ways, things are being set on fire, like rioting. It becomes an early flashpoint of kind of, of, of straight barbarism. It's not like these, these battles of motion where people fight, soldiers fight, they lose, civilians are being in, 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 involved. And truly, this is when you start having these kind of like, uh, these kind of realizations, things are changing. This is not the Napoleonic War anymore. This is not professional soldiers in the battlefield with muskets. It's the concept of what? Blank war. What's, what am I looking for? It's the concept of blank war. Blind conquer. <laughs> yes. Total war. Total war, okay? It's the concept of total war, that the citizenry is going to be involved and that common everyday people are going to suffer, not just soldiers whose job is to fight and suffer. Sign up for that. What you just described by the nurses, was that on both sides? Or Absolutely, yeah. Just, this, uh, is, this is so sad. Like, again, I'm saying, you know, again, I love making jokes. This is so awful and sad. It's terrible. Sin isn't funny, right? And uh, just and, and venereal disease isn't funny, you know. I, I don't know if people laugh about, oh, they got, I got syphilis. That's freaking terrible, right? Like the brain eating parasite or something, right? It's not terrible. Well, isn't it always terrible to have an army in your land? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, who who wants that, right? Right, exactly. Isn't it always terrible for the citizens? I well, mean, they need food. They're yes. Looking for food. They're looking for yes. Right, land. but but there is you're 100 right. But there is this idea of like ever since the Christian era. Yeah. I mean, this is, the, this is definitely worse than Genghis Khan and whatever. Did the, the soldiers were supposed to they, be doing Well, that? sure. They're, 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 now, now, no, then there is a kind of code of conduct, right? There's supposed to be this kind of gentlemanly restraint. How is that followed in practice? Often not, sadly. But there was this idea that, like, here's the battlefield and people fight, but people leave the normal people alone. We're not, our war is in the town. How often do we say, like, we don't like country X, but we have no problem with our people at that thing? That's what's supposed to be. I'm saying here you're getting this kind of thing of where it's the, the, this is not a battlefield. This is a siege of a city, right? And you ask about the prostitution stuff. Yeah, like that's the oldest. Unfortunately, although I think people go both ways. Like there's some soldiers who in the face of death, like I'm going to die tomorrow. I'm going to start praying the rosary and go to confession and die. 
other people who like aren't believers are like, well, like some eight year old kid, well, I've never had sex. So I'm going to go visit the brothel every week, kind of that response, right? And this is cool. Like I'm going to die tomorrow. So I should like, I should hook up with everyone. Like it's really, really, it's not funny. It's not, it's really it's nothing funny, but that, that's the reality. And unfortunately, um, I, you know, I as a man will blame men and true, but also some of these young nurse women to same idea. This is adventurous. This soldier is so dashing and we're all going to die. So why not? You know, kind of stuff like, and that, yeah, it creates this absolute cesspool of disaster on top of the already war and all that kind of stuff. Right. Kind of like the plague. Yes. There were similar reactions. Sure. There extreme events bring out extreme reactions. Extreme holiness and extreme sin, extreme evil, right? This is your lost generation. Sure. I, you're you. a freaking genius. Exactly. Why in the 1920s do people start hooking up like they do now, unfortunately? What the, the, the sexual, the sad state of sexual mores in America is not a recent invention. It's 100 years old. It's because people were like, great. I had all these old beliefs. I went through World War One. I got a trench foot on my head. All my friends with their heads blown off. Nothing matters. I might as well have physical enjoyments. Who cares? Yeah, I mean, that, that kind of loosening of morals, the, the, you've all heard the flapper women in the 1920s, short skirts and stuff like that. It's long before kind of, you know, <clears throat> the sexy music videos and the kind of stuff, scandalous stuff. Now, this is 1920s. This is, again, World War I, I need mean, it. The roaring 20s. The roaring 20s, right, exactly. What was roaring, exactly, roaring. Of, you know, fast living and alcohol and speakeasies and promiscuity, right. This is why I argue in this class that our culture today, was, our culture was created by this event. In these ways, what, were, what were the years of American prohibition? 1919 to 1933, I think. After the war until 33. Yeah. 13 years. Yeah, just like over a whole decade. Whole decade points, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so just, I want to scoot the slides now, finish up super quick. Just the Battle of, of Warsaw, the Battle of Łódź, okay, in Polish, L is slash there is a W. And as you the dot is a sound wooch, but in America say battle of lodge, right? Uh, these are more what I have to in close, these are more kind of stalemates on the eastern front. However, guess who's making progress? Surprisingly, these guys, right? The Russians, the people that had been really just destroyed in Tannenberg. And I was making the jokes about baby back ribs, and by September 1st, it's like the Germans are gonna win the whole war. Now it's like, well. The first thing in the Western Front is Harden. We have the race to the sea finishing trench warfare. In the East, the Russians who are, are winning at Warsaw and kind of pushing back on the Germans a little bit, um, maybe they're gonna hold on longer than we thought. Maybe they're not gonna collapse immediately. And they have definitely more manpower. Maybe they're tactically deficient, but they're gonna hold on perhaps against the Germans. A lot of casualties and attrition, maybe we're holding on. Russia, the Ottomans, the Black Sea, the Russians in a certain sense, they, they raid the Black Sea to provoke the Ottomans. Um, to, uh, to 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 the, the, the Germans support the Ottomans in this raid on the Russian port to get the Ottomans into the war. Okay, uh, the Germans who are angry about the performance of the Austrian areas, we need our allies to, to, to join to combine our forces and let's go. Um, what's a final victory? Final thing on the board is invasion of Serbia. What's a final? This is a final victory for the Allied side. Right. T today's class you can break it into two groups: A and B. A was the four September first, all Germany, all Germany in the east. This most this is the Tannenberg is the biggest victory of nineteen fourteen period. Okay, please note that Tannenberg is the biggest victory of nineteen fourteen east or west, the most clear, clear cut, amazing victory. Before September first, you can say it's all Germany. They're winning in the east. They're winning in the west. The war is soon to be over. Germans are going to take over. Sweden plan, despite it maybe not working perfectly, they did it. Wow, the Germans, how impressive. By the end of the war, by the end of the year, things were much more complicated. You'll see why does the war become one of feudal, feudal attrition? Because this latter half of 1914, the Serbians who are on whose side, on the Allied side, the war begins when the Austro-Hungarians bomb them across the river. Remember, Serbia will eventually lose. They'll eventually have to surrender. They get kicked out of the war by the Germans, by the Austro-Hungarians. They hold off beautifully. These battles like Sir Adrina in 1914, they are holding their own against a much larger army. Austria-Hungary, grade F for 1914, right? Everything they do, Conrad's offensive here, fail. It would be nice if Conrad, the Germans beat the Russians. Hey, Conrad, you beat them too. He loses to them. They keep retreating and they can't even beat the Serbs. So maybe the greatest loser of 1914, I don't mean this is like a funny ha, -ha insult, the way Trump says loser. I mean, actual like loser on the field is the Austro-Hungarians. 
The Allies can claim victories. We held Paris, right? Sophie, that's good. Paris didn't fall. And uh, our guys are performing okay. The Russians are bouncing back as well. They can claim, despite a humiliating defeat, we're bouncing back. The Germans had a great 1914 in some ways. It took so much land in Belgium. And despite not having the knockout blow, they seem pretty well set up. Austria-Hungary has nothing to recommend themselves by 1914. Despite my deep love of Austria-Hungary's beautiful Catholic and polyglot empire, nothing, right? Just kind of grade F. Um, okay, let's look at the slides super fast. We have like three minutes. I have to be out of here by 9.54. So, uh-oh, can we do it? Let me get all of you online to see the slides. 100% battery. I can turn the computer. Okay. Eastern Front. All right. Some of the things we talked about. Okay, so Tannenberg is up here, right? You see, it's North Danzig is the monastery of Gdańsk. Vilna, Vilna is the capital of Lithuania. We see where this kind of stuff is taking place. Uh, this is Lodz, uh, Wuch, as we would say. Here's Krakow, I talked about. Here's Przemysl down on the border. Uh, well, I'll show you um, Lvov in a second. Um, but again, all, the, all this is taking place mainly in what is today modern day Poland. All right, this is a map looking ahead. Look how far Austria and Germany will get, the, the central powers will get in 1918, that green line. Look at the yellow line, which symbolizes the front at the time of the Russian Revolution and the furthest uh, Russian advance, right, in 1914. Past some of the cities we just talked about now, right? Wuj Lemberg is Lvov, okay? And Kiev is the modern day capital of Ukraine. Chernobyl is right there. Uh, again, all of this land, despite these countries not existing at this time, official on the map is basically Poland and Ukraine, that kind of middle ground between Russia and, uh, and Germany. Here is a nice example of the Battle of Tannenberg put on a map. You see uh, Ludendorff strategically positions troops based that's on- That's map. That's your map? Excellent. Yes, yeah, it's a good map. You're right. And look at that, right? That, that blue line, that's terrifying. 150,000 troops outflanked and encircled. And look where, where Redenkampf is. Redenkampf is on the top, the Russian First Army, okay? So Russian First Army never receives the order to, visit, to assist. Um, and the communications are in the clear. So divide and conquer. Uh, Maria, who you did, get. Who did receive the order? So Sans, Sansonov, who the guy on the bottom, the outflank guy, tells Renenkamp, the first army, um, please come help me. We're, this is happening. This four pronged thing is happening. He doesn't, they, they can't get there. But I think some other people have, have argued, not conspiratorially, but kind of that Renenkamp heard it, but he said it wasn't worth it. Not to like throw the guy to the wolves, because we can't get there in time. And our, it'd be strategically better to whatever, which is kind of sad. And, you know, but like, well, maybe you have to make that decision. Right? We can't get them. They're going to lose anyways. If we go there, we're just going to die on the way. Maybe all of us will die. Uh, mm -hmm. These are from Tannenberg. Mm -hmm. why, is, why are you being this way? Freaking uh, PowerPoint. Okay. These are Russian prisoners. Here's more Tannenberg. Here is Lemberg, Lvov. Can you go that one? Mm -hmm. What's can you describe what are those bicycle riders? Absolutely no idea. Yeah, no, really. I always want to tell you that too. Honestly, I want to, I want to be honest. That way, when I tell you stuff, hopefully you'll trust me. Like, oh, this is actually a blah, blah, blah. I have no idea. It could be. I I even wonder, I don't know. Would they be doing it? I'm serious. For exercise, like that. Well, they've got wired. Maybe that's communication. Right. So, so they're, 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 they're either it's, it's practical for power. I would even get. Let's go with that. That seems way better. But I wonder even like, what if like, you know, from marching, the Germans who are so, they think of everything. Marching a long time, a recent study, study says, go on the bike for 15 minutes, like help circulation. I don't know, but you know, but I, I think no, it's more practical to seem that it would be actually for the purpose of something, energy production. This is modern day, a lot of, I'm showing like modern shots like this. This is modern day Lviv or Lemberg, Lviv. These are beautiful cities. Um, if you ever, much turns like a tourist agency, if you ever a chance to go here, these are very unknown places in Europe, uh, Central or Eastern Europe. You know, I'm going to go to, to Milan. I'm going to go to Paris, Rome. Great. But a lot of these cities. For sale. What? If I want for sale. One of those bicycle things. Oh, cool. How much? Um, $20 million. These are the Missourian lakes. This is the, remember, this is number four. This is the follow-up. 
And this is, this is, a, this is a beautiful area. Mm. This is the follow-up to Tannenberg. Germans defeat the Russians at mm. Tannenberg. They keep pressing their, look how beautiful this area is, seriously. But these guys are not going to see it like this. As they march through, that's how they fight the Missouri and Lakes already in some ways. You already have mm. some snow in this area in September. Um, so imagine like in shots like this, like imagine the, the, the difficulty of um, fighting in often underdressed. They don't have their Arctic's whatever Patagonia snow gear, right? Mm -hmm. At this time, adding to the horror of this, right? Well, if you don't get shot, you'll probably freeze to death. So, and there's no food, right? It's, it's horrifying. It's actually in a museum. What's in a museum? The bicycle. The bicycle. Oh, so you cannot buy it. That's too bad. That is too bad. Look where Pshana so. Oh, good. So it was, it was a practical purpose. It wasn't. Yeah, like they it said. Was, oh, good. It was a, a, a generator. Okay, cool. Uh, important cities we covered today. So here's the Missouri and Lakes we just talked about, right? Off from Canterbury, capital of Warsaw, fine. Um, premise still, so we're getting now on the city, but it's almost in Ukraine. This is the great uh, pole. I think the, this is the Paris of Poland, Krakow, the most beautiful city in Poland, I think. The Carpathian Mountains, that is which, here's Conrad, right? He's trying to push this way. He's going to go, right? As the, this is the, super, super important. As the Germans are beating the Russians up here, our allies, the Austrian Hungarians, should be doing this. They're doing that, right? They're getting beat that way. So it's moving in two opposite directions. Przemysl too is a beautiful city. One of these beautiful old, again, Central European cities. That is a nice shot. Here's the kind of outlay with the fort, the, the, the circumference of the fort. Remember, this fort turns into just kind of hell on earth, right? Actual photos from the fort siege, pictorial representations, and finally the city of Wuj. So you see right at this point, okay, what does it signify? Someone, most brilliant person. Uh, Przemysl is down here. So if we're fighting here, what, what is it signifying? The Russians are moving this way. The Russians are on the move, right? It's central Poland, they're moving, you know, closer to you. Look where Berlin is. You can see already see Berlin on the map. As the Germans are doing this. Russians are doing that. It's World War I, constant attrition, constant trade-offs, stalemates, and we haven't yet reached the entrenchment phases. Uj at the time. Cecily, we're not gonna have time for the, the video today, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, you, oh, you can't look it up, I made it. What do you mean look it up? Look it up where? Okay, guys, best to all of you. Becca, thank you for joining us. You guys are all the best. Have a beautiful, wonderful day. Five things in the chat. Guten Morgen, mein Vater. Is your mic on? Not anymore. Smiley face. Excellent. Um, and meeting for all. You guys are the best.